Um, hello, and welcome to USC Roski's School of Art and Design, um, Designs uh, Lunch with Creative. Um, thank you for taking this hour to join us. I'm Haven Lynn Kirk, the Dean of the School, and it's lovely to have everyone here today. Um, before we begin, and, I, and excuse me, I introduce our special guest, I wanted to give you a little background about the series and today's uh, event, and an overview of today's event. Um, you'll notice that all of today's participants are on the screen. We recommend that you take this time to select speaker views so you'll be able to see any images that we'll be sharing. The audience participation will be muted during the talk, but will be unmuted at the close of the event if you'd like to ask questions. And if you do have a question, um, just as a courtesy, maybe first raise your hand or indicate that you have a question in the chat and then we'll go ahead and unmute you. So the Lunch with Creative series was designed as a conversational creative pause with art and design professionals. And it invites unscripted talks about timely topics and issues. For this year's series, we wanted to focus specifically on Roski alums who have diverse and unusual careers and creative trajectories that reflect back to the important values that our school holds important. So let's begin. Um, today's special guest is USC Roski alumna, uh, Haley Francis. Haley graduated from our school with a BFA in art in 2008. I still remember her well as a student. <laughs> uh, while a student at USC, she embraced student life by studying abroad in Italy. And she was also a Getty multicultural intern at the California African American Museum. And her varied interests also led her to complete a graduate certificate in nonprofit management from the USC Sol Price School of Public Policy. Before she began her important work at the Smithsonian, Haley served on the Museum Service Council at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. She went on to complete a master's degree in museum studies from Harvard. Her practice also includes the extensive work that she's done with the award-winning Kinsey African American Art and History Collection, one of the largest private African American art collections in the world. Her research and didactic were published in the Kinsey Collection in 2010, which was then adopted into Florida's K through 12 statewide curriculum and complements their traveling exhibition. She's worked at the Smithsonian as fundraising, curatorial, and public programming projects for nationally touring exhibitions such as Men of Power, or sorry, excuse me, Men of Change, Power, Triumph, and Truth, uh, Robert Blackburn and Modern American Printmaking, the Negro Motorist Green Book, and now leads the Advancement Department at the Smithsonian Center for Folk Life and Cultural Heritage. In 2016, Haley also re received a mirror. Um, excuse me, mural um, appointment to the DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities Board to help steward its 20, 30 million um, city art budget. In 2017, the American Alliance of Museums, AAM, invited Haley to serve on the National Program Committee for the annual museum conference under the theme Gateways for Understanding Diversity, Equity, Accessibility, and Inclusion. In the spring of 2019, Haley also became an adjunct faculty member at Trinity Washington University, where she's taught the, she taught the inaugural class, African American Art History, one and two courses. And I could go on. So <laughs> <laughs> um, she is an artist, a scholar, cultural producer, African American historian, museum professional, and <laughs> arts educator. And um, through commitment to scholarship exploration, community engagement and amplifying voices through the arts and education. Haley embodies the, the shared values that our school still holds so secret, uh, sacred, sorry, <laughs> not secret. <laughs> um, I'm delighted to welcome Haley Francis um, here today. So, uh, so hello and welcome Haley. It's been it's so nice to see you and welcome home uh, virtually. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so grateful to come back home to USC and um, this is really exciting for me. Yeah, we are so proud of you. I, 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 sh I should say that too. I, 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 I'm sorry, school mom, <laughs> right? So, but, yeah, um, well, let's uh, go ahead and get started. Maybe you can give us an overview in your, your own words, your pathway and um, share a little something about your current practice. Sure, well, um, Again, uh, as Haven said, I am a Roski alumna um, and 
studying at USC was really, really fun. I got to learn a lot and um, I'm just gonna dive into my presentation. Um, so in a nutshell, my career journey embodies scholarship, service, arts and culture. And this is a throwback. My mom sent mm -hmm. this to me who is on the line right now. Um, this is from the CAM newsletter, the California African American Museum, which is where I did my Getty internship, highlighted myself and my friend Elena, who also is out here in DC and works at the Smithsonian. Um, and so this is just a throwback pick from when I was a Getty intern working with the registrar um, and that's where I uh, did my first exhibit, which was the Kinsey Collection. Mm -hmm. um, I studied abroad in Italy, as Haven said, and uh, this picture on the upper left is of me at a 16th century papermaking mill in a city called Bavania. Um, down below to the left, there's a picture of me go-kart racing with this really lovely couple who on the bottom right, mm -hmm. I was introduced to by the really wonderful family who I told you I worked with, um, Bernard and Shirley Kinsey. They connected me with some of their friends that live in Sinalunga, so they took me out go-kart racing. The upper right is Halloween. We made our own Halloween costumes and I was a Hershey kiss, so that's why you see that <laughs> outfit. And then the middle, of course, is my first self-portrait, which I did in Italy as well, and learned the um, gilding technique, which is what you see in the background, goat leaf. Um, so just to kind of zoom through the timeline of when I graduated, it was during the recession, it was really difficult to find a job at a museum because a lot of museums had hiring freezes. And that's really what got me interested in the cultural, the financial sustainability of cultural institutions. And um, during that time, I was invited to work with Bernard and Shirley Kinsey as they launched their foundation to expose their private collection to the world. And um, while I was concurrently doing that, I was also volunteering at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art on their Museum Services Council. So, so that's why I was able to sustain my engagement in the arts, even though I wasn't working at a museum full time. And I ended up at USC working in the financial aid office, which was totally not <laughs> arts related, obviously, but um, I was able to do a nonprofit management and policy program during the time that I was working there. And so from there, I decided I wanted to get back into art. And that's how I transitioned into fundraising because of my um, thinking around how to support arts organizations, even during an economic downturn. So um, I moved across the country. I went to Washington, DC in 2013 for um, an internship at the Smithsonian and their Central Office of Advancement, which is a term we use for fundraising. And uh, I worked on some projects with their uh, national board. And I decided to stay in DC and got involved with the American Alliance of Museums for uh, the Museum Advocacy Day, which uh, is an, it's a lobbying event on Capitol Hill in which different museums from around the country come together to discuss funding from the Office of Museum and Li or the Office of Museum Services, which is under the uh, Institute of Museum and Library Services. So technically what we were asking for con congressional members to do is fully fund the budget, which Obama set to 25 million, but I think maybe only $24.6 million had been given away. And we were just you know, advocating for using the full budget, which they approved. Um, and in the meantime, before I was back at the Smithsonian after my internship, I worked at the um, Beck Center for Social Impact and Innovation at Georgetown. So then I got some of the social impact work under my belt and I did my graduate program at Harvard in museum studies, which was a hybrid program. So I was back and forth between Cambridge and DC, um, taking classes physically on campus and through live webinar. So I ended up back at the Smithsonian in 2016 and their um, traveling exhibits department, which exposes the Smithsonian to the rest of the nation for those who can't travel to Washington, DC. Um, and then in, the, in 2016, when the National Museum of African American, National Museum of African American History and Culture opened, um, this was like a full circle moment for me because the art collectors I had been working with, um, I'd main, maintained ties with and were able to enjoy some of the opening events together. Um, I won the public service prize at Harvard for mainly for the work I was doing um, through the 
Black Alumni Association at USC, which is a mentoring program. I usually get paired with a student uh, in Roski or a student in another realm of the humanities. Um, and um, my thesis was Museums and Social Impact, Anacostia Community Museums New Strategic Direction, which was published um, in Harvard Digital Libraries. And um, the work I did with the mayor's office, oh, sorry, the public service prize was obviously for this part too, um, for the mayoral appointment to the DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities in which I worked alongside my commissioners to approve about $60 million in grants to DC arts organizations um, from 2016 to 2019. Um, so right now I'm actually doing some public programming for Men of Change which again is a traveling exhibit from the Smithsonian that is on a 10 city national tour. It's currently in Los Angeles at the California African American Museum, even though um, most museums are closed around the country. So we're hoping they're able to open up so that the Los Angeles community, community can see it in person, but otherwise you just have to engage online through their digital public programming and their, um, uh, their uh, really beautiful video that they created which gives you a virtual tour but this is this picture is actually a um a picture from one of our planning meetings in which our architect for the exhibit was kind of walking us through the structure that he was creating with us so there are 25 contemporary artists in it most are african-american men we have one woman nina chanel abney and um everyone's super talented and brilliant so i highly recommend even you know just checking out the website to see what the art looks like and it is my joy to let you know that one of our Roski alum, alum, alums, alum. Anyway, Tariku Shifra is also uh, a Los Angeles native. We were at uh, USC at the same time in the School of Fine Arts and his career is taking off into the stratosphere. I'm so proud of him. And so working with him and being able to include him in this project was just one of those full cool circle moments. You know, I always have to, bring things home to USC in some kind of way. Um, and also uh, the director of this wonderful exhibit is Marquette Folly. So that's uh, the woman featured in the, in the white uh, tunic. So this is just to give you a sense for what the interior shots look like after um, it was installed. This particular picture on the left is at the California African American Museum. The one on the right was at the uh, Cincinnati National Underground Railroad Freedom Center, which uh, is the first venue that hosted the exhibit. Um, and then of course, uh, these are just a few of the artists. One on the left is Knowledge Bennett, who's a wonderfully talented and thoughtful artist and a dear friend. Um, Alfred Conti, another artist on the rise who's just doing amazing work. He featured Alfred, um, he featured uh, Ryan Kugler as a man of change. Um, and then Devin Shimayama, who is another brilliant artist who has such a unique look. Um, his art is easily recognizable. You just know it's a Devin Shimayama piece. He um, rendered Kahinde Wiley. I think this might be the end of the presentation. So Haven, if you wanna um, kind of dive into the next portion, I can stop sharing the screen if sure. that works. Sure, okay. yeah, beautiful, beautiful work. And um, oh, so many questions. All right, so. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, you, you've done so much. I mean, I, I, I'm going to go, I, I'm definitely going to go off script a little because uh, <laughs> okay. um, I feel that there, I have questions. And, and again, um, I want to make sure that I leave enough time for, you know, audience participants to also ask questions. But um, so, I mean, some of these projects, I, I understand that, you know, I call it pulling a thread. You have an interest in something and you go to the next thing and you go to the next. Mm -hmm. thing. But in your case in particular, I mean, you really, you have done so much. And it's interesting to me how um, um, a lot of art majors, you know, the, their focus is on their practice, not on the community aspect of it, and the way that you've brought other young creatives together. I mean, it, it, I, there, I have to commend you for that because that is always something that you know. Um, I think we're protective of our own creative space, but when you have individuals that understand that, you know, um, how important it is to also promote the you know, your, your peers and your colleagues and, and to make sure that, you know, important work gets shown. So how did that start? Where did that come from? Because um, again, you know, that, that is very unique to you as a person and it is one of the value systems that, you know, that I, I cite 
um, as an arts educator that we all should have, right? To be part of the larger community. Well, really it comes from A, being an artist mm -hmm. and understanding very intuitively the needs of artists. Yeah. And um, one saying that I have is that I love art, but I love the artist more. Mm -hmm. So I don't merely look at it from just the, the standpoint of what an artist created, but mm -hmm. who created it. Mm -hmm. So for me, community is very important and being able to have those sort of ties with other artists just makes, it makes it more fun for me. You know, I don't, with, with fine artists, it's very easy to get stuck in a silo, to get stuck in your studio, um, especially when you're, you're in project, production mode and you're just constantly working and skipping mm -hmm. meals sometimes or, mm -hmm. you know, kind of get in your own head. But I think going to Italy um, actually also kind of helped to influence that for me since I shared an artist studio with artists who, like our, our monastery that we stayed in had a studio downstairs. So we were living and working together every single day. Right. And I realized how much I appreciated that and just wanted to continue that um, in my professional work as well. So maybe I can put that in context. The, the residency that Haley is, is speaking of is actually uh, a fairly long-standing um, study abroad program that Rossi's had for, oh my goodness, I don't know how many years. I mean, I've been with the university for 18 years and so even before I came, so it's got to be at least a couple of decades. And, um, but in particular, because, you know, I mean, what is it about going abroad that maybe, you know, gave you this epiphany moment? Well, <laughs> I think going abroad taught me that it taught me to be kind of fearless in a way um, because there's a moment I remember when I lost my luggage and I was so frustrated. And, you know, when you're in another country, all the signage is in another language, everyone's speaking another language and you're the outsider and you're kind of trying to fill your way around. So imagine getting off of this really long flight, yeah. being totally just jet lagged and get to the airport. I had like three suitcases and everyone's like, why do you have all that luggage? I'm like, I'm studying abroad. Anyway, <laughs> so I had, um, one of my suitcases got, went missing and I was just freaking out, mm -hmm. but trying to keep it cool, you know. So one of my uh, professors, my art history professor, and I, she, we really clicked. Mm -hmm. And I just remember a few days had passed mm -hmm. and I told the director of the program, like, I, I got to get back to the airport and get my luggage. Mm -hmm. And my professor drove me to the airport and she said, um, from now on, I'm not speaking English to you. We're only going to speak to each other in Italian. Wow. Go <laughs> your luggage. And I was like, okay. So I went into the airport and I came out with my luggage. And that for me was one of those really affirming moments that if I kind of just take a leap, right. then my wings will start to spread. Right. Instead of being so fearful that something won't work out that I, right. that I won't try it. Right. And then even when I moved across the country, it felt like, of course I was leaving home. I was leaving my safety net and my network and my loved ones. But at the same time, I thought, well, I'm only going to Washington DC, you know, I'm still in America. It's not like I'm going to another country. So mm -hmm. I think that kind of just prepared me for those type of moments. Teach, it teaches you to be nimble and flexible. Right. And when you have, and, and I think what's interesting is, you know, it's the unprepared moments, the challenges that you have sometimes and travel really brings that, you know, Absolutely. Reason. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I love that. I, 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 I love that story too. I didn't know that story, but <laughs> that's wonderful. Um, yeah, I had shared this with Haley that, you know, because I, I've known her for a fairly long time and at a distance, has been, I've been watching what's been happening with her career, but, you know, um, I'm taking this hour to personally, a little selfish to, to kind of catch up and, and find out uh, in detail um, some of the stories that she has, because she really has done so much and it, it you know, her experiences have become so varied. So, um, so here's a, a, this is a museum question, right? So uh, how do you, you know, I, I know that part of your, you know, pro professional aim right now is to broaden access to museums. And I think that is not just commendable, but, you know, I mean, I, I understand what that task looks like. It's already complicated enough that people sometimes that don't grow up with the arts don't understand, you know, uh, what sometimes what the value is of going to a museum. And I, I know that with artists, there's also the additional challenge of, you know, the pathway oftentimes to exhi um, exhibitions and exhibiting at that level is also incredibly complex, right? Yeah. Um, so I'm talking about, 
you know, access for practitioners as well as access for, um, you know, art patrons or, or people that support the arts and also for people that may not feel that somehow, you know, uh, the art world is for them, but those are exactly the types of communities you do want um, to come see exhibitions because of the storytelling. Oops. Uh, again, unscripted. <laughs> Go ahead. So maybe you can speak a little to that. Sure. Well, um, just to kind of give you a little bit of background, my mom really was the person that introduced me to museums and nurtured my creativity creativity from such an early age. Like she's literally has a, um, like my first drawing from preschool, my mom still has it. Um, so there's a picture of me sitting on the steps of the California African American Museums with my sister and I had to have been about maybe six or seven. And I understand that for some communities, museums don't feel as accessible. And it's partly because of the type of exhibitions that museums have. So if you don't see yourself or your stories represented in those particular spaces, they just don't feel like they're for you. So coming from that understanding, um, there's a certain conversation happening across every sector when mm -hmm. it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And um, now that the museum field is grappling with these same um, complex ideas about identity and um, what it means to be represented, um, who belongs, who doesn't, um, I've, I've been very interested in how to address that in my work. And Men of Change is a prime example of how I've been able to, in some way, play a role in just advocating for artists who may not have mm -hmm. been mm -hmm. considered for a Smithsonian exhibition, but were absolutely outstanding and great additions. So it kind of just opens up the conversation to, we should be looking broader. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, there's a, a report that the Mellon Foundation produced about, um, you know, museum diversity. And it did focus on art museums, but it's, it's definitely emblematic of the larger field. Mm -hmm. And one of the, uh, the facts that they brought forward in their survey after speaking with many, many museums across the country is that a lot of the intellectual positions and the leadership positions in museums are mostly held by white people. And the larger the budget, the larger the salary, of course, but mm -hmm. if it's a really large museum with a large salary, then mm -hmm. the um, director position would typically be a white male. And so um, there has been somewhat of a shift because now that people are more um, engaged in that conversation about mm -hmm. diversity and inclusion, you're seeing that there's a rise in people of color Mm -hmm. in intellectual and curatorial positions. And that definitely influences what type of artists will be in a museum, what type of um, exhibitions will be curated and what type of communities will be engaged. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, I, I find that uh, the correlation, like I said, between uh, participants, you know, and participants that uh, visitors to museums, as well as, again, artists that are being included. And unfortunately, you know, as you said, sometimes people that are the the institution organizers may not be the the right voices as well. So it, it is it's, it, it is a very interesting, um, I think, dynamic, because I do think that as uh, we're able to get more people into the museum to enjoy the arts, right? I mean, obviously, you know, the, the hopefully the, the scales will continue to tip, but at the same time, it, it is, uh, doesn't move fast enough, does it? Uh, that's for certain. Definitely not. Yeah. <laughs> Slowly yeah. but surely. Yeah. So I mean, uh, you know, this is part of your world day in and day out. And I'm I'm wondering, so, you know, are there things that you think that um, um, not just the museums can, can do, but people that really are supportive of the arts can do to ensure that, you know, that uh, we keep continuing to move in this direction and maybe even a little bit more rapidly? Well, I think mm -hmm. people have to be open to the idea that there has to be a shift. Mm -hmm. There has to be a new way of thinking and doing things. We can't work within the same paradigms that have been used right. um, for many, many, many years because it's not working anymore. And that's why people are so vocal about it. So I think being flexible and open to these conversations, even when they're really uncomfortable is a mm -hmm. starting point, but either way, things are going to change. So it's a matter of, are you going to get on board with this train or right. not? Because it's moving either way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's exciting. It's very exciting times I have to say. And, um, 
um, the, the show that you have going at uh, California African American Museum. I'm assuming that we have a lot of students here, you know, make sure that you take advantage of it. Uh, just in the time I've been at USC, I've been surprised, you know, we have this, we have all these wonderful museums across the way, and I understand some of our science museums, but, you know, CAM in particular is, uh, it, it's, it is kind of a treasure in our city, and uh, students oftentimes don't find out about it until kind of late in their, you know, their, their time at SC, and, and there have been just so many terrific shows, and, you know, Roski's had so many really wonderful partnerships with them as well, so. Yeah, they're literally right across the street, so. Literally, I know. It's like, even if you don't walk in LA, you can walk across the street, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, I'm going to move a little into a, a little different direction, because um, I know that you're working on a really interesting project right now uh, with ArtX Lagos, right? Um, well, maybe I you can Mm -hmm. Yeah, I attended uh, their art fair. Art X Lagos is the premier West African art fair. Right. Um, and uh, it's a really, it's, I guess, if you think about Art Basel or mm -hmm. Freeze or Untitled, mm -hmm. um, and you can liken it to that, but it's so well executed. Mm -hmm. um, There's so many brilliant artists that exhibit work there, and it draws the attention of, you know, their major collectors, um, some of which are, uh, when I was there, I saw people from London, from the Tate mm -hmm. Museum, like literally, you know, it draws an international audience of collectors and mm -hmm. um, art critics and um, socialites. And it was, it was such a brilliant event. So mm -hmm. I had gone there um, with a friend of mine who's also very deeply involved in the art world, mm -hmm. um, more so from a consultant side, Jeremiah Ojo, mm -hmm. um, who has this um, organization that um, just, helps to teach artists the business side of what they do since that's so critically important. And usually, you know, when you study fine arts, you, you learn the technical side of it, but then when you leave, you may not know the business side of it. Right, right. So um, I attended that as well as um, Fashion Week, Lagos Fashion Week. And I was fortunate enough to go to the market and work with the tailor to get some clothes made, including this. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it was just a really wonderful trip that gave me um, a window to peek into the world of what black artists are doing across the diaspora with a specific pinpoint in Lagos, Nigeria. Mm -hmm. mm, wonderful. Oh, again, you know, that's one of the things about uh, the Roski School, right, is how art and craft and design all merge together. It's one of the, the rare, yeah, schools that actually have all three, the, that, that wonderful little um, triad of, of things, you know, skills that, that I think people bring to the table. And tell us also, one of the things I like to say is that, you know, design has brought me all around the world and it sounds like you're on a similar trajectory <laughs> with your travels. So I know that you also did a, a trip um, as part of Fashion Week, right? Is that yeah. right? Tell that us a little bit about that. that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Lagos, Nigeria, so. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry, but but maybe a little bit more about the fashion part of the the. Um, well, yeah. what was really cool about the fashion week part of it is that yeah. the designers were talking a lot about shifting paradigms about about Africa and how people view yeah. Africa, how people um, understand culture, which through the Western lens I, we don't get the full breadth and of understanding. Right. of the continent and um so they're using fashion as a catalyst for having those conversations about their own culture from their own vantage points from their own narratives mm -hmm. and um it just opens up this broader conversation but the fashion was absolutely stunning it like high fashion by any standards right. and i actually wrote an article about it that launches on monday um and it's published through the Smithsonian um, Folk Life magazine. So I can definitely send you a link for that as well. And just the link and we'll put it on the Roski website. How's that? Okay. So, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. All right. So uh, you, you've also mentioned fundraising a few times, which is another one of those like unusual things that uh, not just that you're open to it, but that you have made it so much a part of what it is that you do. And um, again, as a designer, I have a similar thing, which is that, you know, we always kind of fund our projects, we find ways of having um, maybe more control over our practice by finding, you know, some financial independence sometimes in the things that we do. So maybe you can talk a little bit about that and how you've brought that skill set to some of these institutions that, and projects that you've been involved with. Definitely. So um, at the Smithsonian, I lead our fundraising department. 
at the Center for Folk Life and Cultural Heritage. Yeah. And prior to that, I was on the fundraising team at the um, Smithsonian Institution Traveling Exhibition Service. And a lot of it is project-based. Mm -hmm. So um, we're funding different exhibitions and um, in the center I'm in now, they host a, a festival every year on the National Mall that we fundraise for. And so um, we're also fundraising for a diversity initiative to uh, increase our pool of um, interns from diverse backgrounds that reflect um, the diversity of America. So um, I really lead the strategy on our fundraising program and um, do a lot of board management and board relations, donor relations, donor research, and all sorts of stuff mm -hmm. like that. So that's pretty, in a nutshell, that's pretty much what I do. All right. That's wonderful. It, it, I think the, the code word at USC is it's networking, right? <laughs> you develop your networking skill. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, <that's> <laughs> All right, so um, I'm going to ask one last question, and then I'm going to turn it over to our our, our guests here. So, okay. uh, and this is an easy one. So, what's next for you? What What's your next project? Where are you headed? Is there a trip planned? <laughs> oh my gosh, I wish I did have a, a trip planned. I miss uh, traveling. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> during the pandemic, it's hard to really, yep. you know, take as many vacations as we really want to, but. Um, one of my new projects, actually, I just worked on a, um, an art project for a voting campaign, just to encourage people to get out and vote. And I painted a portrait of John Lewis, which um, is now a poster that, it's a digital poster that people can either download or um, I think prints of the poster are actually going to be sold as well. So I can send that as well. I'll post it on Instagram today too. But um, again, you know, merging art and civic engagement um, and civic participation is something that I've kind of found a nice balance between. When I was um, in undergrad, I remember thinking a lot about art and civics. And so I've kind of found ways to do that um, on my own terms, so. Wonderful, that's that's wonderful. Okay, so uh, if you would like to, I know this, there's quite a few people that have also turned off their videos and I, I do the same thing when I'm just kind of listening, but um, if you, It'd be nice to see your faces. So if you would like to turn on your video and if you have a question, you can either virtually raise your hand, physically raise your hand, um, or indicate in the chat that you have a question and, and uh, I'll let all of you speak directly to Haley. I do have to say hi to Nicole Nicholas. I went to elementary school with her. <laughs> hi, Nicole. Yes, hi. Yes, hi. <laughs> I and saw Jessica. that you were speaking. I'm like, I registered. Hello. Long Yay. time. Ago. Thank you so much, Jessica. My mom. Shana, Taki. Yes. <laughs> Thanks so much for having us. Yes, absolutely. This has been great. <laughs> Yeah, uh, we have found during the lunch with creatives, especially with the alums that have been out of school for quite a while that, you know, some of their, their schoolmates um, show up for, for these things. And it's, it's so nice to see. And uh, oftentimes it leads us to find out about um, other things that, that, you know, people are doing, uh, alums are, are doing. And again, if, uh, if you're not part of, you know, our school, I, I will just tell you that, you know, it, such a diverse array of different kinds of creative professional. It's always wonderful to see what they've done with their, mm -hmm. you know, with their education and where they've gone because there are so many leaders uh, in, the, in our creative world. So uh, anyone have a question? Uh, we can keep talking. <laughs> oh, go ahead. Yeah. I'll throw it out. Hi everyone. Um, uh, this is the first time, first one I've been to. My name is Michele Floriani. I was, Welcome. Uh, thank you. Um, Graduated in 94, is that possible? Yes. Um, wow. and, uh, okay. yeah. and um, yeah, no longer practice art, sadly. And uh, I'm a you know, chief marketing officer of a health services company. And so this was therapy for me today. So thank you for doing this. Cause I like, it came in my inbox and I'm like, I can't think of a more stimulating way uh, to spend an hour that's not a corporate call or anything like that. So this is just therapy. Um, so nice to hear creative, uh, be around creative people. Um, so I have two questions for you, Haley. First of all, is I've been to La Vagna and, uh, and that part of just, you can tell my name is Italian. I was born in Milano. So my whole family is up there. Ciao. Um, yeah. <laughs> Mustai. Um, bene, grazie. <laughs> Um, yeah, I came to the States when I was young enough to ditch my accent and acclimate to a California guy. But, 
but got sent back a lot, which was awesome. Yeah. Um, so my first question is a silly one, but have you ever been to Focaccia di Reco, which is to me the best focaccia stand in the world, and it's just south of Lavagna on the coast? I don't think so. You got to go back. It's I, oh, I will. I need to write that down. <laughs> it that is literally like world famous. I'm salivating just talking yeah. about it. So Focaccia <laughs> di Reco, uh, some of the locals you'll know. That one's free. Now, uh, my second one is, I, and I love uh, the line of, of the week for me is, you know, I love art, but I love the artists and like what you were doing and this whole idea about investing and in getting the kind of ecosystem around art going. And, and you guys spent some time talking about getting people into museums, which, you know, I think Haven said on a good day, that's kind of a hard challenge. And now with everyone locked down and just kind of a little bit, uh, you know, not, I'm sure some of these are even closed. Um, has there been, have you seen anything interesting about bringing museum art to people through digital channels, right? I mean, you almost get permission. I know probably the purists would be like, well, that's not what it's about. But now you actually get permission, I think, to try to, you know, activate access through digital mechanisms. And have you seen anything interesting? Because that could be the start that then gets people to show up in person. Sure. Yeah, you bring up a good point about breaking down those, you know, the art world can feel very um, closed off and inaccessible to people. So through digital engagement, we've been able to break down some of those walls and just open up museums to really broad audiences. And um, even with artists, they have been able to connect with people directly on Instagram and you know do Instagram live sessions and um, different webinars and Zoom talks just to kind of help people understand their creative processes and what what it is that makes them passionate and um, why they create the type of art they create. I've seen curators doing talks with different people and um, I've seen a lot of digital activity that gets a lot of traction from people who are not in the art world. That's great. I mean, I was just think again, I'm, you know, just I'm the reference point of one, but I'd sure love a tour of, of, of somebody's museum installation by the artist while I get to sit here on my lunch break yeah. and hear about people talking about their paintings. And, it, you know, it would just be, it would be, you know, pretty close to stimulating me like being there in person. It, yeah, there's, I've seen accessible. a lot of that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So That's encouraging. I think if yeah. you follow some of your favorite museums or even museums you've never been to before, you may see that there's some pretty um, consistent digital engagement with the artist and different yeah virtual tours, virtual exhibits as well. Okay, good, okay, thank you. Well, one of the things that we've noticed during, you know, during this time because of the classes that, you know, now that we have to go online is quite a few of our instructors are sharing that um, during class time, even if it's during that time where they're actually creating work, right, they'll leave their videos on because there is something about that connection uh, and to have people work with one another, which is, you know, quite different than I think uh, the, the kind of constructs that we've had when we're in a classroom setting. And the students really love that because they, you know, like I'm in my studio, this is not my house. And obviously, you know, there's something about being in your workspace and inviting other people into your workspace that's, that is quite different than, you know, when you're in a classroom coming as a yeah. professor. So um, I, I have to say, you know, that, that's maybe one of the lessons that we've learned during COVID is that, you know, uh, there's there's some differences. There's obviously differences and there's pros and cons, obviously, you know, we, we all miss each other too. And I don't know too many artists that would say that they want to stay remote. I mean, almost everyone wants to be back in, back in the studio, back in the classroom, you know, back on campus, but. Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So um, do we have any other questions? I, I know that there's quite a few people that haven't turned on their videos and please, please feel free to turn on your videos. Again, like I said, even if you're in your pajamas, it's okay. We won't, we won't, <laughs> we won't tell, right? <laughs> so, yeah. But, uh, you know, the, um, this event is intended to be conversational. And again, like I said, to introduce different groups of people. Um, oh, I'm going to introduce somebody. Sorry. <laughs> Suzanne Lacey is joining us. She's one of uh, our, well, I mean, renowned artist and a professor, and she's just amazing. Are you in your studio as well, or is this your house, Suzanne? Oh, you're muted. Yeah, sorry. Got to remember to unmute yourself too. <laughs> so she, she's probably hiding something. Here. <laughs> you unmute her, she? 
<laughs> oh no, she's plugging in, I think. So yeah, and that's the other challenge is technology is it just makes everyone a whole lot more informal than they used to be. So, I know. Yeah, it's we're embracing that. We like that. Yeah. <laughs> Here she comes. Hey. Oh, I think she's still unmuted. No, no. Can you hear me? Oh, we can hear you now. Yeah. But I have this giant headphone. I haven't figured out yet how to get all of my different systems together. How you look very you? cool. No worries. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm just very excited to uh, meet you, Haley, and, and uh, hear the work you're doing. The Smithsonian, um, are you working with the actual African-American uh, aspect of the Histonian, uh, of, of the Smithsonian? I missed the I, first part of this. I I work at the Center for Folk Life and Cultural Heritage. Ah, Prior mm -hmm. to that, I was at the Smithsonian Institution Traveling Exhibition Service. Yeah. And um, uh, I don't know what I was about to say, but I do remember doing a project, a public um, program that you hosted, Suzanne. Um, hmm. This was, I think in 2007, um, mm -hmm. at MOCA related to the women, like the feminist exhibit. Do you remember that? No. I don't remember the <laughs> but I just remember there's a public yeah. program. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, it was it, it really could have yeah, there was some citizen culture thing as well. But at any rate, so when you were in, you, you've traveled a lot, you said, to West Africa. Have you run into any of the performance artists there? I'm extremely curious. My friend Dominic Wilson, who's a curator, has brought back, you know, it was at SF MoMA, has brought back different performative uh, artists from Africa. So that's quite, quite the thing in my field now. I have. Um, I actually know an artist she's actually based in London and she's part of the black British female art artist collective who is that and her name is Adelaide Demoa uh -huh. um and there was another public there was another uh performance art piece that I actually didn't get to see in person so so I was able to engage fully with it when I was there but um the other artist is NM, oh, I can't remember her last name. Sorry, NM, but she also does um, performance art as well. And she's based in London, but they're both Ghanaian artists. You know, I would really love to know about them because I am working in London now. Of course, I'm okay. not there, but I'm working. And so I would love to hear about them and be able to meet them when I go. Oh, sure. I'd be happy to make that connection for you. We can, we can directly connect you to Haley um, after this. That's yeah. great. Okay, yeah. thank you. It's, it's nice to see you, Suzanne. I don't see her that often. <laughs> so we have a few more people. I'm here, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. Um, so if anyone else has a question, uh, like I said, feel free to ask her anything. I mean, I think she'll, she's very generous about sharing information. So, don't and be uh, shy. Uh -huh. don't be shy, I know. <laughs> Yeah, I, I had mentioned to Jean a while ago that, you know, whenever we have these, these talks, so I, I call them talking head events where, you know, someone stands in the front, shows you images and tells you things and it's less conversational. And it, there is something nice about, you know, being in a more intimate setting and being able to talk to the speaker, but there's always people that hang out afterwards because they really want to have a one-on-one. -on -one. And one of the nice things, I mean, about Zoom, um, especially if you don't have hundreds of people and events like the Lunch with Creatives was designed to be a smaller event is that you can actually talk to, you can talk to the, the guests and um, frankly, you can speak to one another as well. And, you know, it's, uh, it's really um, wonderful to, to meet new people, learn, learn new things, uh, find how you're connected because what brought most of you here is that you have a connection to USC. So, and, Haley really is one of ours. Yeah. So we're, we're, we couldn't be more proud of her. Thank you so much, Haven. Yeah. So um, you're back in Washington. I just saw you a week and a half ago, I, I guess, and you were here in LA. So yeah. just you're back. Yeah. Uh, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm working on a new portrait series yeah. and I need to be here <laughs> working instead of in the warmth of LA. Yeah. Um, so again, it's, still in the works, but I'm very, very excited to share my new portraits. Um, I'm scaling up my work a bit. The one that I showed in my presentation, my um, uh, so portrait that I did in Italy was 
nine by 12 inches mm -hmm. and the portraits I'm doing now are 30 by 40 inches. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so um, you'll definitely be seeing those once they're ready. Great. I can't wait. Wonderful. All right, so thank you all for joining us. Uh, we have another event that is coming up before the end of the semester. It's Yuji Sakuma, who is a designer. So Haley, I don't know if you went to school with Yuji. I think that you, the two of you may have overlapped. Uh, he, he's, he graduated a few years before you. Yeah, um, I think he did the NYC study design tour course. He did, he yeah, did. Yeah, okay, I was in the same, he was in the first one, right? It, yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. Yeah. That. yeah. Uh, very early in the days of our study tour. There's a lot of travel at, at Roski right now. We we try to squeeze in as much as possible because we also believe that, you know, in order to be a, a, someone that, you know, is invested in the world, you actually have to experience culture firsthand. And so, um, yeah, uh, we have a New York study tour and we also have an international study tour. And once we can get back, you know, in action again, I'm sure we're going to have another trip planned or coming up. Um, that sounds amazing. Yeah. So uh, Yuji Sakuma will be our next speaker. He's a quite different career. He's more of a designer. Um, was in New York and in London for a while and he's now back in LA and he has a very interesting project. So uh, please join us, feel free to invite others. It is open to anyone that's even remotely connected to Roski. And um, we curated this to, to have very interesting uh, creatives that have uh, again unusual careers and uh, but came from this this exact program that most of the most of you that are on the, the call are familiar with so yeah thank you so much for joining us this afternoon and uh, I'll see you soon bye